one of the things that our athletes constantly talk about is when to adjust the strategy. Most of them believe that, again, given that the skill is within the similar range of the opponent, it's the team that does the better job managing and adjusting strategy that usually wins. And that's like that's one of the games within the game that they love to play. So that would be like one of their pregame questions is, at what point are we reevaluating our starting strategy to see if we want to make any adaptations to that? How do you teach that? Learn everything we can about playing and coaching beach volleyball. You are always welcome to visit our website, betteratbeach.com, where we have a number of ways for you to get better as a player and as a coach. We have online training programs for every skill where you, we can take you step by step through tutorials and drills. You can fix your passing, setting, arm swing mechanics, attacking, serving, defense, blocking, and practice planning. If you've ever asked yourself, am I really doing this right? Like I have for so many years and I did for so long. Well, we created programs and we invite you to jump into one of our skill specific courses where we can help you erase bad habits and get more control of the game and learn easy strategies that can convert losses into wins. Our most popular online program is our 60 day max vertical program guaranteed to add inches to your vertical leap as well as speed, agility, and mobility, which will keep you playing for years and years. Eh and keep you healthy. So we provide online coaching and mentorship from real professional athletes and coaches, and it's perfect for, pe for people who want a coach to take their game to the next level. We would love to see you at any one of our seven day beach volleyball vacations where we train you, we coach you, we hang out with you, and you get to meet like-minded people. And if you're like me and you like vacations to be active and fun, and challenging and full of sunshine and new friends that are easy to connect with this is the way to go come on to a better at beach training camp and we will hook you up with all of that if you enjoy this episode please subscribe to the better at beach podcast and share the episode with one of your friends uh give us a rating i actually don't know how to give a rating on my own podcast but if you can find out how would love to get that from you now for today's guest, she spent eight seasons with the AVP, competing in over 80 career sand tournaments and representing the United States abroad. She is well known throughout the sport and has worked with some of the top athletes and coaches in the game. She currently serves as the chair of the AVCA, that's the American Volleyball Coach Association All-American Committee, and as the beach representative on the AVCA Board of Directors. She has led her team to six 20-plus win seasons. The 2022 season produced, produced the most successful national championship run in Georgia State sports history and a program-high 28 wins in her tenure at Georgia State. She has twice earned the Coach of the Year Award for her university, and in 2016, she was named the CCSA Coach of the Year. She is brilliant. She is a fantastic coach, and she's so much fun to talk to. So, without further ado, Beth Van Fleet, hello and good day. <laughs> Hello and good day. Thank you so much for having me um, on the podcast, Mark. It's been fun watching the tutorials and everything you talked about, putting them all together and getting to watch. And I'm really excited to be part of your show today. Thanks. It's going to be fun. Yeah. Looking forward yeah. to it. No nerves. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, you, you've got a lot of roles and you've done a lot of things in the sport, but uh, today's a Wednesday and yeah. we're in yeah. July. What did you do today? What's, yeah. what's a day in the life? <laughs> so I think I'm supposed to be recruiting in California. That seems to be where most all the coaches are. I'm here in my office and I'm also a mom. So today my daughter came to work with me because she didn't have camp. So just spending a lot of time organizing, looking at gear for the upcoming year, really exciting. And uh, looking at some recruiting materials as we're getting ready to go out to California in a couple of weeks. What is a recruiting material? What do you mean? 
just looking at the different emails. So there's so many different websites and ways that the athletes correspond with us. So going through the different emails to organize who's going to be in what tournaments, whether you're using one of the um, online Racket Pal or Volleyball Life, looking at the different events that are gonna be out there, who's gonna be playing, when we can find them, where we might be able to find them. Mm -hmm. The recruiting scene for beach volleyball is really interesting. Some events are organized really well and you can walk up to a court and figure out in about 30 seconds who you're watching. And some you can stand there for like 10 minutes, like listening for someone's mom or dad to say their name or their partner to give them a high five and say, good job. So you never know exactly what you're getting into. So you have to kind of be prepared for all of it. We won't throw anyone under the bus, but uh, let's throw somebody over the bus. Who runs the best recruiting events or oh. your favorite in terms of going to ease as a coach and, and places to see? So I love that question, and I don't think I can actually answer it because it would be endorsing an organization. Um, okay. But I will say some of the most popular events for recruiting, the BVCA championship, that's one that most of the college coaches go to. Um, there's a bunch of events in Tavares, Florida that are really well run as well. So just kind of around the country, there's they're great. And I think the neat thing is, every year they get better and they get more organized um, mm -hmm. and the athletes do a better and better job of letting you know who they are as well. So I don't know if you've been to any of the juniors tournaments, Mark, but you'll walk by and there's, it's, it looks like a triathlon. Like everybody's got Sharpie all over their numbers legs. everywhere. Numbers right. Yeah. Teams. Yeah. It's really helpful for us um, when, when they look like that. Okay, cool. Well, uh, when you go to recruit do you have you know kind of like when you go to a, a music festival and you're like oh i have to see them 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 wow. and then i'll float around or do you go in with like a completely open mind and say like i can't wait to see what i see today i love that analogy the music festival <laughs> yes you go in with your hit list um okay. but i will tell you my hit list has gotten me to the wrong court multiple times and I sat there watching someone who I thought I was supposed to be watching to find out it was the wrong person, but I really liked that person anyway. So um, it's like finding a new band that you like. Um, so yeah, it's a this doesn't way. sound like the Lumineers, but they got a good beat. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Nice. Nice. What are you specifically looking for? So when, when you show up to one of those, are you looking skill, strength, speed? Are you one of the coaches that is like, yeah, everybody's got the same skill, but I want to see when you screw up, um, yeah. how you're reacting. What's the weight of importance between like this? Do you think you can fix players mentally and emotionally if they have the skill or do you not even want to deal with that? I love this question. I think you look at the total package, right? So you're looking to see is someone moving well in the sand? Is that, you know, is their reach pretty high? Do they have a nice platform? Are they bettering the ball? Are they making the ball worse? We love, most coaches love watching how they talk, how the athletes speak to their coaches, how they speak to their parents. Like the little insight into character is really important. I think that beach volleyball coaches are really good at teaching beach volleyball skills and not necessarily good at, at like our training is not in, I agree. Changing someone's character or changing someone's personality. And I think we absolutely strive to help everybody grow. Mm -hmm. That's part of any coach's job, but it's much easier to take an average athlete who has the desire to win and to grow and develop that is comfortable with failure than it is to take someone who is an elite athlete with a bad attitude. Do you like to see somebody who's cool with losing? To me, like, you know, there's, there's this, this passion, like I want somebody to be pissed off when they lose. I don't, you know, I don't want them to completely, you know, talk down to everybody around them when they're losing and yell at somebody else when like nothing is their fault. But yeah, I would love to see somebody who truly cares. And I'm not, again, I coached NCAA for what, two years. Um, so looking at that type of attitude, I wouldn't necessarily take them off of my list as soon as I threw the, saw them throw a tantrum uh, when they lost. But did they go off and throw their own tantrum and kick a garbage can alone? Or did they take it out on all the people around them? To me, 
yeah. you know, I've kicked a few garbage cans. <laughs> right. Like how high can you punt a ball when you're angry? Like, mm. I think that's an important skill. Yeah. Athleticism, um, you know, that shows good leg strength. <laughs> are you left footed or right footed? Those things are important for us to know. Um, so my dad was huge in my upbringing in sports and he raised me with, show me a good loser and I'll show you a loser. So mm. that's what he told me before every match that I played throughout <laughs> middle school, high school, club, everything, because he had, he was someone that was going to go kick over garbage cans. And mm. I think I would just look at it like this is a learning opportunity. And generally, I think what I've learned as a coach is there are so many different ways to approach competition and coming off the AVP very much what you just described. I was like, well, if someone's not losing their mind after they lose, they are not motivated to win. In our first four years here, I had this awesome opportunity to work with an athlete from Arizona. Her name was Milani Pickering. And she was so unfazed in everything she did. And I constantly told her she was boring to watch. She was, she was so boring because she never, ever looked like she cared. Mm -hmm. And after she graduated, she came up and said, you know, you never understood me. And I was like, okay, explain you to me now, now that you've graduated and I can't help you with beach volleyball anymore. She's like, I worked so hard not to have an emotional response to a point, because if I had a blank slate going into the next point, I could get that one. And it was really one, I felt like I failed her, which was really helpful because it's helped me to be a better coach. But I think it helped me to also understand that a lot of people care in a lot of different ways. And I wrongly assumed that she didn't care because I wasn't reading her body language as caring. I was misinterpreting her. Uncomfortable because I felt like you didn't understand that she was trying to cool herself. Yeah. So she prepped for the next point. Yeah. But I mean, I do think it's important, like when we're watching kids that are uncomfortable, lo like losing a match hurts, like that does sting. There's nobody that shows up to play any kind of competitive sport that walks out saying, Hey, I'm, I want to go out there and lose today. Nobody ever steps onto a court with that mindset. And I think in the process is what's most interesting to me is if you are losing in a game, are you still trying as hard as you can? Are you still communicating? Are you still strategizing? Um, if you've lost a game, that might be a different response because at that point the game is over and there's no hope that you can get the next point. Mm. how many yeah, trash I, cans, yeah like are you kick a lot of trash cans around i'm a big trash can kicker <laughs> i i you know i tell this story a lot and like luckily like my my wife is is really cool with it but when parents or loved ones like try to talk to you right after a loss oh. i'll take this back to, to casey patterson right when he lost in the olympics way earlier than he thought he would he got real pissed he walked off the court. He walked off center court and everybody's like on sports and like, blah, 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 blah. And, you know, I couldn't understand how people didn't understand that emotion yeah. at that moment. Like right. you've worked your entire life for one goal. You're there, you're on the stage, and then it goes completely the opposite of everything you wished and wanted for. And then they want you to go up to another guy who ripped out your soul and smile and shake his hand and it's just like yeah i get sportsmanlike conduct and i get you know being able to show up at that moment but how do you leave zero room for hey here's your dream here's your dream and i'm going to smash it to pieces in front of you and then be nice to me right you know i mm -hmm. completely felt for him in that moment and he went backstage he went shook, shook both their hands he's like hey man sorry i flipped out um great match done but i don't want to talk to anybody directly after a loss. directly after some losses there are some yeah. losses that were like you you hit some goals that you wanted to hit maybe it wasn't the win but sometimes you're looking at matches you're looking at partnerships you're looking at teams and you're saying hey what is our actual goal is it beyond this match beyond this tournament and are we building up to that so we have incremental right. goals for ourselves or is it you know that we should beat this team and so when I, in college, my dad never really got involved. He was always the, I will play with you. I'll show up. He goes, yeah, you want to learn baseball? I'll throw a baseball with you. You want to learn hockey? Sure. I'll buy a pair of rollerblades and try to learn how to rollerblade at 60 years old. <laughs> uh, but this one time, like after college, after a really tough loss, he just started talking about it. And he was like, you know, you guys didn't have that energy. I couldn't understand why you're doing this. And I was just like, 
I got real heated. And before I completely blew up at him, I go, Pops, right now, you just need to stay quiet for me. You need to pat me on the ass, say, tough game. And then I will come and talk to you about volleyball and strategy and tactics and energy when I'm ready. But oh, you yeah. need to let me like simmer for a while before I flip out. Yeah. Um, and my wife lets me do that. You know, she at same thing at tournaments, all of her friends like, Oh, look how sad or mad he is. Like, go help him <laughs> make him feel better. And she's like, Mm-mm. That <laughs> let is him impossible. Cool off, then we'll come back. <laughs> Yeah, you know, that's why that's why like in boxing matches they have that little minute break in between rounds. It's like uh, go to your yeah. corners, literally go to your corners in and a come moment. Right back. Yeah, I it's so interesting because people process sports losses so differently. Mm. For me, the moment that a game is over, no matter what stage, how big or how bad it was, I am still in the moment of knowing I I gave my best. And so I am pretty good for probably 15 minutes to an hour after I lose. Wow. And then as I start reflecting after an hour mark, I start having to monitor, you know, if my daughter's around, I have to watch what I'm saying because the emotions start creeping into it after a while for me. So like, I think I'm a bit of a late processor. Yeah. You get a slow, a slow simmer. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> do you, uh, for your teams, for, for your college teams, do you have talks about the game directly after the match? Or are you the type of like coach where it's like, hey, let's get back on the bus. Let's go home. We'll talk about this on Sunday or Monday or whatever. That really depends on the pair and the situation. Mm. And I'm very much like you, like after a tough loss, the last thing I ever would wanted to do is sit there and listen to my coach, tell me all the things I just did wrong and why I lost, because at this level with these athletes, they all know I'm not telling, if I sat there and reflected on the entire match, I'm not going to tell them anything that they don't know in that moment. And so oftentimes if we had, you know, something that we were trying to accomplish, like, Hey, we did this, our strategy was to do this. We did that well this is why they this is why they beat us or this is why they won and just kind of open up the conversation for the the pair that we're looking you know or just that we're talking with and sometimes they want to have a conversation and sometimes they don't and it really really just depends on i think on the level of the game the level of disappointment the one thing that we always do is after a win we reflect on it as though we lost because especially if it's close because if you, you know, squeak out a 16, 14 win in the third set and you're feeling great about life and you go run on to whatever is next and celebrate, well, the team that almost beat you is sitting there reflecting on in and learn uh. then you're so much. Right. And so you're going to play them again. And so it's better in those moments if you sit there for a second and reflect as though you lost, like, hey, what are a couple of things that we didn't do well that we would do different if we played this game again? Mm -hmm. And then take notes on that for when you play that pair again. Yeah. Why did we lose 14 points? Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's so interesting. You know, there's like AVP, there's, there's so many differences. For example, why do so many people stay at the top of the AVP? Is it skill or is it just repetition because you get all these qualifiers and qualifier teams and, and i did it you know when i when i was young you show up on thursday yeah and play one match two matches against a medium level team and yep. you lose and then what do you do you go out you party booze because you're in a new city and you're in your early 20s and there go the next three days without you playing volleyball because your flights on Saturday night or Sunday. Meanwhile, all the better teams spend the next three days playing against better and better and better competition. So now yeah. you traveled across the country to, you know, play for two hours and then waste three days. Yeah, you would have been better off if you stayed at home and practiced every single, you know, two three hours every single day. Really? Yeah. No, we used to uh, when I was in that process. I remember going to players parties and looking around and realizing it's like, oh, actually the best players aren't here. Like this is everybody who is actually not playing anymore. And I remember I was playing for a little while with Sarah Lynn and we would say like this weekend, are we packing to party? Or are we packing to play? Like mm. what's the place that we're going to? What's our draw look like? 
But one of the things that we did a lot in that process that I think has translated really well to the college game was because there were definitely tournaments that I flew across the country, lost in the first round of the qualifier, and then was stuck there for the three days. So I would usually follow the team that I lost to and take notes on who they played, how other teams beat them or how they beat other teams. And I had like this whole Excel spreadsheet. I totally geeked out on it, but had all sorts of notes on all the teams. If I would have had, if I would have won that game, the path that I would have had to play (laughs) because I wasn't able to play for those three days. I, uh, you know how much you talk about like, or or they used to talk about like Karch's black book, you know, that he had like notes on every team. And if you played on his team, you got to, you got to see them for the first time. I was pretty disappointed that I didn't keep stellar notes. I'm still playing the same freaking guys. You know, it's been what, 13, 12, 13 years, something like that of playing AVPs. And it's like, I should have extensive notes. And I realized a couple of years ago I didn't. So then I just started developing this um, like fully question led thing so that our players could have it at Better at Beach. It's not complete yet. I think it's still like a month and a half from being complete. I love that. But it's got all the questions that you should ask before a match. Mm-hmm. And that you should ask after a match, you know, like, that. hey, like, what strategy are we actually going to to do? Who are we going to serve? Where are we going to serve them? And then why? I think in my 20s, I never I, it was always serve this guy tough. <laughs> yes. You know, it wasn't yeah. now it's serve him short. Why? Because he's a power athlete. He likes a long run up approach and we need to mitigate his height because we're small blockers. So we're not really going to stop him from hitting hard unless we shorten him, you know, and we have to bring him inside because he likes to hit cross. So that's why we're serving him short middle. And it's like that never happened for the decade of my (laughs) twenties. So now I was like one person really hard. Uh, how should we serve them aggressively? Great. You're brilliant. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think it's really interesting too, like going through those questions pre-game and post-game. One of the things that our athletes constantly talk about is when to adjust the strategy. Most of them believe that, again, given that the skill is within the similar range of the opponent, it's the team that does the better job managing and adjusting strategy that usually wins. And that's like, that's one of the games within the game that they love to play. So that would be like one of their pregame questions is at what point are we reevaluating our starting strategy to see if we want to make any adaptations to that? How do you teach that? How do you, Um, do, do you have a, Hey, at this point, this is when we always check in for me, it's like the technical, like the technical is your first real reassessment and for everybody who doesn't know what a yeah. technical is it's the score when the total score reaches 21, 21 so 11 10 or 12 9 and that's when i'm like okay we've attempted this strategy lo- or we should have yeah. attempted this str- strategy long enough to get at least some clues do you have a a hard line where you say this is when we check it back in we don't have a hard line i think it's it's really different if you have a coach because we have potentially five pairs playing at once and only three coaches so if they don't have a coach, if a pair doesn't have a coach in the box with them, then absolutely at the technical, or if one side takes a timeout before the technical. Okay. Um, but then if you have a coach in the box with you, it's really easy to check in on the side changes based so, on what tendencies are starting to pop up. And so it's really one of the conversations I have with my my husband very often Uh, I'll be like, well, we asked them to do this. And he's like, what do you mean you asked them to do something? I was like, well, I, you know, I suggested maybe we serve the other person to her sideline. And he's like, you don't tell them what to do. And I'm like, absolutely not. I can't tell you how many times I'll make a suggestion to a team. And they're like, yeah, we definitely don't want to do that. I'm like, this is your game to play. I am just here to support you. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you what I see. I'll tell you the tendencies that we're picking up on, but ultimately the decision-making and the power needs to be in the hands of the athletes and not the coach. So if, if I'm on the sideline, to help, you know, barking orders at them, they're not actually learning any problem solving skills. And so I think that's where that strategy adaptation comes in because by me suggesting something and them saying no, or them saying yes, they have to have the reason why that you just kind of like, why we don't want to change this because, or we do want to change this because, and I think, that's one of the coolest things about this game 
is there's not ever a right or a wrong thing to do. And it's really easy, you know, sitting on the sidelines saying, oh, you should be doing this the whole time. But if you have a different read or a different feel in a game, that's important, that's worthy, that's valuable. And I think it's important to follow that until you realize it's a dead end and maybe the coach was right to start off with, mm. or maybe not. I like, yeah, I, I like being having players figure out. And I think, you, you know, I, I think like maybe like most teachers, most of our, most of our teaching comes from our failures, you know, like our, our pains. And I think that my lack of paying attention to what was happening in game there, you know, I, you get the end of the game, you lose on a, on a cut shot that you missed and you blame the entire match on that cut shot that you missed on game point. And so you, you go for the next week and all you hit is cut shots. And it's like, Hey man, you passed to the back line like five times. Yeah. You know, how, how many points did that lead to? How, how much did that drop your hitting percentage? Yeah. So I, I have two questions for you. Do you think okay. that there's a type of athlete that with a coach can exist or be better now than before coaches were allowed because to me somebody for so long who did not pay attention to what was happening in game if i had have a coach on my sideline telling me what was happening and what should happen next then all right now i can just go out and be a warrior bang my head against the wall and do whatever they say are you seeing the same athletes as when you competed on the avp the same like type of mindset be successful or does a coach allow a different athlete to be successful? So you have all different types of personalities, right? And where we are with the juniors piece today, there's just not kids that don't have coaches anymore. Like they grow up from the time they're 12 or 13 in a club. They only play beach volleyball when there's a coach present. I asked at a clinic a couple of years ago, I was like, hey, how many of you ever play without coaches present? And so many of them raised their hands and I got so excited and they're like, yeah, there's not always a coach on our court when we're at tournaments. And I was like, oh, okay, that's not what I meant. Um, <laughs> but I think, you know, part of, I think part of you in your twenties, like part of it is ignorance has a little bit of bliss too. Like if you are overthinking or you're someone who plays better when you're not cerebral, then having a coach on the sideline may not be an advantage for you. I think, one of the neatest kind of players that we get to coach, I call them chameleons and they're very rare. It's a very rare breed, but they're the kind of person and the kind of player that very much already has like a coaching mentality or a coaching IQ and they can adapt to anybody that they play with. And I think that's really valuable now. So I think that person would have been like the old school days when I was playing the person who would have been able to really be successful without having the coaching available at mm. that time. And I think that's one of the things we ask our athletes a lot. What information do you want from us? Because some of them want very little information. Some of them want to know what defenses we need to run. Some of them want to know what the other team's defenses are doing. So it's really specific what is helpful for each person. And I think in order for a coach to be effective, you have to know what that athlete or that pair wants to hear. Because I know as a, you know, from my indoor days, as soon as my coach started saying things that I didn't want to hear, I would make eye contact, but I would be processing or thinking about something else. Oh, so you would like do the respectful thing by mm -hmm. like looking at them. So they think that you're engaged, yeah. but you like mentally disengaged. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. So, but I think, there's just so many, what I'm learning now is there are so many different kinds of athletes that come from so many different types of backgrounds. Um, and they all have this common goal of wanting to be great beach volleyball players. And I think, yes, there's the skills of bumping and setting and spiking, but then there's the skill of communication, the skill of vision, um, the skill of courage. There's so many intangibles that are involved in this game and this equation. And I think it's really neat to see how different individuals mix that. And then when you find a pair that really works well, like, I don't know. And I'm sure you felt like this when you play with someone who makes you better and all of a sudden you're accomplishing things. You're like, I didn't know we could do that. 
I think that's one of the neatest like magical moments that this sport can offer someone. Mm. Yeah, they're usually six nine. <laughs> yeah. I was gonna say or maybe that's how people feel when they play with you. I don't know. <laughs> uh, I'm, I, you know, for a long time I was the opposite. I was uh, probably too too brutal. So you know how, like you said, you would kind of look at somebody but but disengage. When I I've been hard nosed always. Okay. Uh, my high school was the terriers but like i would like go at things so hard that my college football coach he called me the pitbull terrier he was like he's like oh, wow. i'll never let anybody off and you know we're doing tempo runs and i would always try to finish first and everybody's yeah. like we're doing 15 second 100 yard runs like you don't have to finish first here and i would always make sure they finish first yeah, yeah i was first. like why not work as hard it's as a you race. can it's a 15 second race yeah <laughs> so i was pretty lucky that I had a few guys on my college team that we looked and acted similarly for hard work, you know, mm -hmm. like Hudson Bates, who's now the uh, associate head coach at, at Ohio state. Yeah. Um, he's doing a lot of high performance for USA volleyball as well. But me and him, hard work looked exactly the same. You know, there's like anguish on the face. You put your head down and, and whatever you had to hit, whatever you had to sprint squat, you just did it yeah. and you made sure everybody know. Then you go to some other partners later on, and I probably ruined their relationship because when I looked at them physically, they didn't have the look of hard work in yeah. that moment that I associated with what it was supposed to look like, you know, quote yeah. unquote. And I had to learn in a big way with like talks with my mom and a few other people that hard work looks very different yep. for, from person to person. And yep. you can't assume just because of the way somebody looks or sometimes even when they say it or they talk about because they don't always know how to express themselves, right? you know, that right. they're not Absolutely. working. So I was, I was really, really, really hard on a lot of partners. Some partners really, truly didn't show up, you know, consistently. <laughs> <from day to laughs> yeah. But, some were not actually working hard, but there were yeah. some who were working hard, but they just didn't project it in the same way that you did. Yeah. Absolutely. What a great growth opportunity too. Like, and I feel like that carries on to the rest of your life outside of volleyball. I feel like that's one of the neatest things is learning how to read people. We had very similar to what you're saying, Chelsea Rice, who is playing right now on mm -hmm. the AVP. She played at Georgia State. Was on it, right? Yeah. Yeah. They had a huge weekend in Denver. Mm -hmm. um, she was playing with Brooke Weiner, who was uh, another player here. And Brooke communicated a lot. She wanted a lot of eye contact, a lot of high fiving. And when pressure was on, she would talk more. And Chelsea wanted to be focused and calm and ready for the next play. And it was in the fall, we were doing a bunch of pairings and we took a timeout. And Chelsea was like, Brooke is freaking out. She's so nervous. She won't stop talking. And Brooke said, no, Chelsea doesn't care. She's so quiet. She's backing down. She's scared. <laughs> And I realized that both of them were amplifying their emotion to try to balance the other person. And it was the exact opposite of what either of them wanted. Oh my goodness. Like, well, this is a predicament that we're in. Yeah. <laughs> but like what a cool thing to discover in a moment of pressure that wasn't actually a, a duel. It was a fall exhibition, but like those competitive styles and how people amp up or kind of back, you know, kind of find a steady pace is really important to pay attention to. And without somebody guiding that or being able yeah. to have that, that third conversation, all you think about and you hold it in because you see somebody talking a lot and you don't realize that they're just like getting amped and this is how they fire up. Yeah. And you think that they're just nervous because people who are nervous talk a lot and they get fidgety, you know, but <laughs> that's not necessarily true. Some people who talk a lot are like finally feeling their vibe and finally feeling yep. comfortable. Exactly. And Imagine how many of our like adult players go yeah. through that, never get to have that conversation, never go through marriage counseling, therapy, anything like that, or, you know, like psychology classes or sociology classes. And to think that you can go through and play the sport for 30, 40 years and how many partners you've just shut out or stopped yeah. playing with simply because you misinterpreted their physical or social cues. Yeah, it's it's so it's so interesting. It 
it truly is. And I think the situation that you're in is, man, like I'm so excited for you because you're still playing and you're learning all this on the coaching side. Mm -hmm. I feel like I had a playing career where I felt like you in your twenties, like I just played, we ran ones and twos. We hit the ball hard if we could and served aggressively. And then I started coaching and I was like, hold on, there's a whole nother level of this game. And, and obviously then, you know, since then the game has evolved tremendously as well. But I think it's such a neat situation for you to be in that you actually get to combine both of those things because most people don't get that opportunity. And so I love that, you know, you kind of referenced your 20s and you're like just kind of blindly hitting the ball. And now you have so much more of a why and a reason behind it. And I think like that's one of the neat things about this sport is that it is a lifelong sport and you're not finished playing in five years. You know, you could play for 13, 14 years. Mm. And if you study the partnerships too, the the dynamics of a relationship, if you can learn it the right way, or if you could take coaching and partnership communications and convert it into your personal relationships, or you learn from your personal relationships and you take that onto the court with your teammate, some of the best stuff, and I tell I say this all the time, but some of the best stuff that happened to me as a volleyball player happened in pre-marriage counseling okay. reading <laughs> marriage counseling books and hearing about how people interpret things differently and how just because somebody's acting a certain way doesn't necessarily mean that that's what you you, you know you see you can't take it for for face value and yeah. how do you show up for somebody and give them what you need without expecting anything from them yeah you know and i know that so many people don't have marriage counseling, or they don't have a great coach that talks about mental stuff. Yeah, no, and it is, or, you know, I did the math once, I think, so I played for eight years. And I think I got, I think I paid to have a coach maybe 120 days. Mm. That's how many days we coach in one year in college, I think we do 128 or 132, something like that. Like, it's incredible. So as a college coach, in order to be great, in order to be great at what we're doing, we have to be more than just bumps and sets and spikes and serves. I think the understanding the communication and, and helping the team, the people on the team to understand how to communicate with each other is so critically important. Um, you know, anytime you're in college trying to get 16 to 25 female athletes to work together towards a common goal and how can you have each other's back and lift each other up instead of trying to step on each other to be the number one seed in the lineup. You know, I think, like those questions are really important when you're looking at a college program, obviously at the professional level, you're just looking at, you know, one pair at a time and, and that's so much more catered and tailored to an individual pair, but the communication piece is just as important and maybe even more so. I have, um, this, that little kind of journal that I showed you that we're developing yeah. into something that we could give to our players or, sh or share with our players it's going to be thick i'm trying to make like this kind of giant bible but th there's a start to it and if if you want to check it out if anybody at home wants to check it out uh cool. and i want to talk to you about what you have players talk about before matches because the what's on the screen right now if you guys want to check it out it's called betterbeach.com forward slash partner profile betterbeach.com forward slash partner profile it's a questionnaire that forces you to answer some tough questions and it asks you to have your partner answer them to eliminate a bunch of like the confusing things that we're talking about. One of the things that I always asked and you might find this interesting, but I've done it with a few groups of men and women. It's, Hey, what is the best way pre-match to fire you up? Mm -hmm. Do you want to be alone? Like I, I had a, an all American on my team. He would put a towel over his head and for five minutes he stayed under that towel undisturbed. No, everybody knew not to talk to him. Me, I was walking around there, like punching people in the chest, you know, asking them to hit me in the chest, literally had a slap game going on, you know, so like very, very different. But if you go around and you slap the guy who's hiding in his towel, when he's trying to amp himself up, he's not, not going to be well. there. No. So, so it, it asks you to define that. It asks you to define turnoffs and i'll get to the turnoffs thing in a second uh but it also asks you to define things like what is your best set 
So if you close your eyes and you think, all right, it's it's championship point, 14-13, and I get served, and my name is about to get on the pier if I win this point, what do I hit? How do I visualize that game ending in my favor? And then it also says, okay, now it's 13-14. You know, the other team might win, but you're still getting served. What do you hit? And you have to figure out, you know, if they're different because they shouldn't be because at that moment, what you trust is what you trust. Yep, absolutely. We say, what, what is your million dollar skill? What skill, if you were going to get paid a million dollars to do the same skill precisely three times in a row, what would that be? Or what mm. hit would that be? You know, same kind of concept of what is, what do you want to go to at the end of the game and how do you hit something differently early in the game so you set yourself up to be successful with that at the end? Oh, I want to I want to talk about that. Okay. okay. Um, so if, if you guys are interested in answering those questions, go to betterbeach.com forward slash partner profile. It's just a free questionnaire for you to just discover yourself, learn a little bit more about yourself and maybe share it with your team, teammates, whatever you want to do. I love it. I feel like this is your pre battle counseling questionnaire. Yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> and w when we ask the turn off question, what is your biggest turn off? It was interesting. When I asked the guys what their turn on was, how do you fire yourself up, right? Mm -hmm. How does your teammate fire you up? It was the mentality, and this is done with two separate groups. Okay, it's not a case-wide study, but two separate groups of, of guys, and they all aligned with the other teams trying to take something from us. It's you and me. I got your back no matter what. We're going into battle. We're going into war. Let's have it out. And that was their, their number one like way to get going. Cool. For the women, this is uh, all the open women, their number one turn off, it wasn't across the board, but the number one turn off most common was being mean to the other team yeah. or overly aggressive. And I was like baffled. And I was so glad that I learned that as a coach, because then as a coach, then I took that back to my wife. And when I'm telling her like, you're not good enough, like in the weight room, because that's what fired me up. Like, you can't lift that. And I'm going to show you what I can lift that completely. She's like, I don't like that, you know? And I kept thinking like, we can't work out together because she kept getting right. mad at me. And it wasn't her getting mad at me. It was me saying the wrong thing to fire right. her up. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's um, like the whole but concept. But it's so funny, yeah. those different, different yeah. mentalities, different things that work. And if you don't talk about that, you will literally make a great athlete into a terrible one and a terrible partnership. Yeah, you can lose someone so quickly, so quickly. And I think, uh, have you read the book Top Dog? I, I might have it. I don't know if I, I definitely haven't okay. read it. Because they talk a lot about the differences in men and women and how they compete mm -hmm. and what the odds are and what motivates women to compete and how they compete. And in general, like one of the things that they talk about is if you go into a pre-K classroom, right? So for the most part, kids that are you know somewhat unsocialized and the boys will generally be playing in groups and there will be a clear hierarchy. Like there is one boy that's in charge, he's running the show he, and everybody else is doing what he says. The girls will be generally playing with only two, like two girls at a time, because it's really important for them to stay very even and to feel very even. And so I could see that, like just thinking about that, if, if someone's being mean to the other team on the female side, it's a little bit against kind of something that's ingrained in what it is to be female. Whereas the guys, like you were saying, are all about like bonding to go battle or battling to go bond. And I think that uh, that it makes a lot of sense. It makes a lot of sense to me. But it's a really great book about competition and how it's different between men and women. Top and maybe, dog. I'm going to add that to dog, the yeah. list. Check it out. Thank you. I love getting new books. Well, so long as they come in audio book form. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So what conversations do you ask players to have with each other before a match right before a match they don't really have to talk much because all the work should be done at that point mainly because the way the college is set up we know you know going into this weekend we're playing these three schools these are the three pairs you're most likely to play and we can do all the prep work for that before uh -huh. we even get close and so it's much different from a pro event where you have no idea who you're going to play next um and so we get most of the work done during the week before we get there. And then usually right before 
a pair is getting ready to play, we'll review strategy. Ask them if they have any questions. One of my biggest roles as a coach is to remind everybody to start their workouts on their Apple watches because that is highly distracting when someone realizes in the middle of the game they did not start their workout. <laughs> start your workout on your Apple watch? Yes, you have to make sure that you have your, your workout started. Well, and then like so many different athletes have the whoops and things like that that are tracking, like everything is tracked and we don't do it as a, a university, but a lot of different programs have different tracking um, mm. for re rest and recovery and work and all of that. So. Those are, you know, those are really popular right now. Um, so we make sure everybody's watches are started. And we all your players play with Apple watches? Not all of them, but the ones that do, they care a lot about their, yeah. Interesting. I, do, I'm not do you think those are providing a ton of, a ton of value? I've, I've debated getting the whoop and the Apple watch and like tracking it, but I go, you know what? If something, if a watch tells me that I'm not fully recovered today, but I still need a practice, I'm yeah. going to go get that practice. Like I'm going to yeah. take care of my body as much as I can. I'm going to get as much sleep as I can. Sure. A nice reminder will be there, but if something gets in my head telling me like the day of the match that I'm 60% recovered, like, how is that going to, that's not helping you. <laughs> no. <laughs> so I've, I've, for that reason, I've yeah. stayed, a, stayed away from them, even though there might be some yeah. value, but sometimes there's all that information. That's too much information. It's too much. I feel where I am in my life, I feel like I know my body well enough to know that I would override whatever watch told me anyway. But I also prefer to like navigate without using GPS all the time. And so I think it's just more of like people that are dependent on technology, like our old assistant coach, she'd crack me up. She always used GPS and would go through so many different toll booths. And I'm like, could you read the sign that said toll? And she's like, I didn't see that. I was looking at the GPS. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I, I don't know how my mom and dad still can't get to the airport from our house. Like it's 11 minutes from our house and they did it for 40 years without the GPS. <laughs> right. <laughs> now it's like, guys, you turn this off. All right. Yeah. 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 Digressing. But I think that generally before a match, we'll just kind of review strategy and check in with each person. And I think it's important because some players will get nervous before every game and some players don't ever get nervous before any game. And then some players sometimes will be nervous and sometimes they won't be nervous or sometimes they'll feel great or sometimes their stomach will hurt. And so we do like a little check-in, you know, Hey, where are you? How are you feeling? Do you need anything from each other right now? And it's more of connecting as a partnership right before we play, review the strategy and then, then go out and start competing. And then, working through that kind of what we talked about before is cataloging and adjusting strategy as necessary. Okay. So main questions for you, for your team is strategy review. And I guess if you were to translate that to uh, maybe a juniors tournament or a adult tournament, yeah. it would have to be strategy creation and review. Sure. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Create a strategy, and, come up with how you're going to play. Yeah. Do you have them like remind each other of, what their best X is or what to stay away from? Or is that part of the strategy? We do all of that the night before. So like we'll do visualization, we'll have people talk about what their game plans are going to be, what's gonna help them be successful. And we'll have the team actually say, hey, Mark, you are so good when you do this. Don't get bored doing this, they can't stop it. And the team will kind of talk to each other about what everybody's strengths are. Cause I think that's a really unique situation in the college space is you play the same group of people for so long mm -hmm. and they all, for example, we had a girl, Kate Novak that had a ridiculous cut shot. She's a lefty, had a sick cut shot, but she stopped using it against us because everybody in practice every day knew that's what she was going to do. Okay. And so we started robbing her one of her strengths. So that was something that I really remind her before she played there, like, nobody knows about your cut shot, do it until they stop you. Yeah. Um, and so like those kinds of things that don't happen in any other kind of training environment, because you're working with different groups of people all the time. Mm. So I want to ask about strategy. I, I wrote this before. Yeah. Uh, are there any, just one, I'll just ask for one. Yeah. a specific strategy to stop a specific something. So I'll ask you like in your mind, think of a player whose shot you're 
concerned about and you want to stop it. Okay. What would you do as an AVP player or, or a coach to stop that in terms of strategy? I love this. First thing you gotta do is think about where you're serving and how you're serving okay. and what you're allowing that player to do. So we talk about you either dictate the offense of the other team or you disrupt the offense of the other team. Okay. So your serve should have the intention to do one of those things. And then I know like I, a lot of the AVP players use a lot of different trap defenses and like late moves. And that's something that's certainly trickled into the college space as well. And it's been really fun studying other teams too and figuring out, oh, they do this and we do this. So we generally, uh, I'll say we steal, I, we steal great ideas from other teams all the time. If we see somebody doing something great, we yeah. steal it, but then we name it after them. So we're not taking credit for it. But I think that one of the, one of the things that we saw LSU doing a couple of years ago really well is their defenders, like they'll figure out who the attacker is eye checking. So if they're looking at the blocker, if they're looking at the defender and then they'll use the person. So if, if I'm getting ready to hit and they know that I'm looking at the defender when I'm getting ready to hit, mm -hmm. they'll use that person as bait to get me to hit into the block or to get me to hit at the blocker. And so I think just with some, you know, little late jukes um, with the defender, if that's who the attacker is looking at, you can get, it's really crazy. It's like a little bit of a Jedi mind control. You can really get yeah. people to hit what you want them to hit. And I don't know that that works at the next level at the professional level, but it's really fun watching the cat and mouse game at the collegiate space. Yeah. It, uh, I mean, one of the, one of the first teams to publicly announce that they were doing that maybe good, maybe bad, but they still won some championships afterwards. So people haven't caught up was the, the Norwegian guys. Yeah. Andy and Christian, they said uh -huh. the first set is about trying to understand the other teams. Why? Yep. why they choose to hit certain shots. Is it because they see a block opening? Is it because they see where their defender was? You know, Brad Keenan, who's now the coach of Arizona State, mm -hmm. playing the AVP for a while, he just said, well, if I needed to shoot or if I thought it was time to shoot, I didn't look at the defender ever. I just felt where the blocker was and assumed that there wouldn't right. be anyone because so it's so rare that people double up. Right. Okay, so how does somebody know what – a, a an attacker's eye sequence is doing like obviously you have to look at their eyes but do you run a series of tests i yes. mean okay so we have a series of different uh, defensive series that we'll run to figure out if we don't know already to figure out who the attacker is watching hmm. our very basic general assumption is that blockers watch blockers and defenders watch defenders Interesting. It gets confusing when you have split blockers, but it's really in general, probably, I don't know. You, you think bigger people want to hit? Bigger basically. people want to hit, but they also, if you're a blocker, then you know how to beat yourself, right? So if you're a defender, you kind of- Say, say that one, if you're yeah, a blocker, so if, what? If you're a blocker, because you said bigger people want to hit, but it's mm -hmm. more of, I think, if you're a blocker, you feel more comfortable beating the person in your role because you know oh. more of what they're capable of doing. Okay. Whereas if you're a defender, you might feel more capable of beating the person in your role because you know what that role entails better than what a blocker's role entails. Um, and it's by no means 100%, but it's just, that's kind of where we start from. And then we see if we can prove ourselves correct or prove ourselves wrong, and then kind of go from there. Hmm. Like that. I've, uh, at, at one point I started writing down a series of plays to run. Mm -hmm. You know, I'll run a, a line, a standard line block where you put the defender in the cross and yep. you put the blocker down the line and then whatever swing they did, I have to keep one of my variables the same in order to actually run an experiment. So if I go to a two mm -hmm. and I switch both people, I'm not really going to get a decent amount of information. So then, okay, I'll run a one and then I'm going to leave my defender staying in the cross, but then I'm going to run a four block. Yeah. Right. So mm -hmm. 
Now I'll try that. Now, okay, did he see, did we run an early four block or a late four block? If he ran a late four block, then he might still not have seen the blocker necessarily. Right, right. right? So it, it also depends on your timing. So a lot of those experiments, they're so imperfect because you could have, you could have a blocker who's like, I ran a three, I ran a four, we can't get him. And it's like every motion that you do is so obvious. You know, like when you're yeah. on the ground, we already see you leaning. Right. So they know that you're going to go that way. And not, and, and the other piece of it is how consistent is the set on the other side of the net? Like, is the attacker in a position where he or she has vision every time? Because that's sometimes they just guess, right? And so I feel like that's one of, one of our general rules is you do something until the other team stops you three times, or you try it three times until you decide to move away from it. Because we think once is luck, twice is coincidence and three times is skill. Okay. I don't know. Just a general rule of Same thing three times and that might, okay. I, I, I like that. I, I think keeping those stats and that's going back to like what I was saying in the early twenties is some, I never did. I never kept in game stats. So yeah. when somebody asked me, if you were to ask me in a game, like what's happening, what's going on, you know, what should our next move be? If you can't count, in your head, the number of cut shots that somebody's hit in that set, you're not there. So now right. I'm constantly challenging myself to say, how many times did they hit that? How many times did they hit that? And right. then if I get that number, great. Now, what positions were they in when they hit that or, or, or what did we run? But I don't think enough players right now keep that those statistics. And that's why I asked also that coach question. Yeah. of are there players that you know don't pay attention to stats like i wasn't that the coach provides now an unfair advantage for that type of player yeah. whereas somebody who was always keeping stats anyway like the coach is is basically a, a moot point because they're like right. yeah i had those in my head of course i know <laughs> of course i knew that tell me something i don't know <laughs> yeah it's really interesting because i think you can also get to analysis paralysis, right? Like if you're trying to think too much and read too much, you get to the point where as a, as a player, you're too afraid to make any move. And so I think we try to keep for our, especially for the defenders, you just catalog the last three plays or the last three things they did when they were in system or the last three things they did if they were out of system, okay. keep it really simple and play in the present. I think players probably become way more predictable when they're out of system. Yeah. You know, like when the set's coming from the back line, I imagine most players do something similar and re and repeat yeah. repeatedly. Um, yeah, I know I that I've got like my metrics that I've created for myself when I'm in trouble. I know the swings that I take when I'm in trouble and mm -hmm. uh, you know, for the, for the one AVP player that watches and listens to this podcast, I'm not, I'm not even going to share it. So. <laughs> Don't give away your secrets. No, but at least I have a plan because I also know that my transition offense dropped like 20% when I took the stats for my in system and my out of system or my transition mm -hmm. offense, all of my errors came when I was in transition. So I was like, I have to stop the bleeding before I can actually improve the situation. Yeah. So then I just came with a plan of like, okay, let's do this in a safer way so that there's no errors. Yeah. You want to play clean. You want to have a couple of errors. If you don't have any errors, then you're playing too safe. You, you think so? You think in transition, you should, I, I, this is, this is something I discuss a lot with coaches and players Yeah. in transition is the goal to get a kill or is the kill a bonus? Oh, I like this question. The goal is to win, obviously, to win when we're in transition. So that's a stat that we pay a ton of attention to. And that's usually, if we're signing out the same percentage, it's the transition errors that cause you to lose. So it's not necessarily the transition kills. It's that you don't, I guess that is. So then you don't want to be making errors in transition. Mm -hmm. But if you're giving away a bunch of free balls, then you're making it much easier for the other team to score against you. Yeah, I think there's a difference between free balls and yeah. And getting somebody uncomfortable. And I think we, I just practiced against uh, Nick Lucena yesterday and mm -hmm. it was fun studying him instead of competing against him in the past. I've always competed against him this time. I was just like, what do you do? <laughs> yeah. yeah. And uh, I noticed that he's incredibly good at 
well, I've always known this. His his hitting percentage is actually we're not going to say garbage, but it's not very good. He's never okay. at the top of the AVP um, okay. or the FIVB in hitting percentage, but he's always had tremendous blockers and tremendous defense. Yeah. So he makes next to no errors. You know, like him mm-hmm. getting blocked is rare, and he never hits out or into the net. Yeah. Um, but he puts teams in such an awkward position. I think that he had Phil for a while. Uh, he had Furby for a while and he, and, and Theo, who's a monster blocker that he just uh-huh. got the other team in enough trouble where he could be in a better situation or he led them into yeah. his six, nine guy. That was just like, see ya. Right. Get the ball to that guy. Yeah. No, I think that, uh, there's so much value in that. And I think one of the neat things with him working with Brooke at FSU, like if you watch their team, you see that in how their their athletes play too. Like oh, they really? take big risks, but they're very consistent. Mm. Like they'll they are constantly taking risks in transition, but they don't make errors. They don't give you points, but they get you really uncomfortable. Yeah. Yep. And that's grinding through an entire. I I you know I don't know how many matches you're playing in a row, but I've changed a little bit of my mentality where I I never used to think that people actually got tired during beach volleyball tournaments. I was like, there's no way conditioning plays into it because of how I trained. Okay. You know, I, I went after it. I went hard and I I never felt tired during matches ever. I was always the last guy like chest up looking around, like why is everybody bent over right now? Yeah. Recent years with injuries and then comebacks from injuries. Then you're just like, Oh man, now I get what fatigue is, is doing to people. Yeah. And so teams used to serve Hudson really short. They'd serve him short and he would crush it for the first set, first set and a half. And then it would sort of like melt after that second half. But you had to wait a set and a half to see those results. And then every team did it. So yeah. he just got crushed throughout the tournament so that even if you lose to him for the first match, you've put a couple of chinks in his armor. Yeah. So if you, you, if you have to see him again, at least you gave him a good bloody, you know? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> He's going to be tired. Yeah. I think that's, um, and that's the scary part with the strategy, right? Like you're going to serve him every ball, hoping that at some point he's going to get tired. But if he doesn't ever get tired, then that strategy is not a very good strategy to use because <laughs> he's going to be lighting you up. Yeah. I think you got to know, that player you can't always tell by like their body what condition they look in right. but um if some people look terribly ball, out of shape and they just play super efficient you know yeah absolutely but that yeah that whole fatigue is now something that i invest in not because of even the current match but because of the second time i might see them in a tournament after right. pool play for those people who are paying pool play like yeah knock them out now they'll pay for it later in the tournament when you want to beat them in playoffs Absolutely. And I think that's one of the, one of the interesting things in the college space is the most that we'll play in a day is three duels. Whereas professionally, I think you might play like sometimes qualifiers are like four or five rounds for men, I think, right? Like it's pretty deep, but the difference is in college is most of our events are four, five, six play the first round and our one, two, three play the second. So you're cheering as loud as you can, as hard as you can for someone for an hour and you're playing for an hour. So it's like six hours of output with regard to energy and emotion. And it's really interesting to me how Mm -hmm. fatiguing that is because we get that every year. You'll watch these kids play in juniors and they'll play the 16s division in the morning and the 18s division in the afternoon. And they've just played, 10 matches in a day and they're fine. Like they're like you, like you're like, why is everybody tired? You know? And then you get to college and you're like, yeah. it's only three, but trust me, it's, there's no easy games and you have, and you support your team for the other time that you're not playing. So it's like a, a two hour event and then you get a little bit of a break and then you run it again. Mm. But yeah, I think we should train more like that. You know, I, like Harch, I, I was talking to, oh shoot. Who was I talking to? Oh, Dane Blanton. Um, yeah. And he was saying that, like, Karch changed the way people train. People used to be out there for six, seven hours. Karch was the first one to show up with 20, 30 balls and go for two and a half hours hard, 
reps in a row and everybody after him, he was the one, everybody mm-hmm. after him started like training for that two, two and a half hour time block. Yeah. But when you're in a tournament, especially a VP tournament, you have to play in the morning. Then you take a two hour break. You have to, to restart the engine. Then you take an hour break. You have to learn how to restart the engine. So yeah. I try to space out my workouts now so that I, like if I practice in the morning, I'm actually going to save my lift intentionally for the evening yeah. so that I can train to restart, you know, to, to, yeah. to get those engines going again. Do you think that that's how you should train or is that two to three hour block all in a row? Is that enough? I think a lot of the times, especially for people like when I was playing on the AVP, I had to work a real job as well. So I didn't have the luxury of, you know, being able to train in the morning and lift in the afternoon or whatever. So I think oftentimes it's what your time allows you to do, but if you have the ability to train, I know we've gotten to work with people from across the world and a lot of countries will train for an hour and then take two hours off and then go train for an hour again, because that's almost exactly like a tournament. And Mm -hmm. so if, you know, I think there's value in that and the way that we set up our training, like most of the college teams will do exactly what you do. So they'll lift your condition in the morning and then they'll practice in the afternoon so that you are in that habit of kind of on and off. And then as we get closer to our season, just like you, you know, I'm sure just like you guys do as well. Like when you're playing other tournaments, that's the best type of training for a tournament is on and off and on and off. But I think it's really helpful. I think it's really important to have the same routine. So you might have your, your first game day warm up of the morning, and that might be a lot more intense than your um, subsequent games. But to have that workout or that that routine before you play be the same. So if it's going to be 15 minutes, this is how this is what we're doing in those 15 minutes, and that's structured and it's similar. Then that I think triggers your body for that same kind of output for for an event or for a match. It stinks, I think, for a lot of people that they don't. You don't have that time. You know, the, the, the world is real, unfortunately. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so you always, it's like 75 hard. There's a challenge that makes you yeah. work out twice a day. It's not easy for no. people. But even if they did do, you know, like one of their practices or one of their lifts and then find 15 minutes or 20 minutes to restart your engine somehow, mm-hmm. like later in the day, whether it's a, quick uh, interval sprint to like 80 percent 90 percent something that teaches you that once as a volleyball player once is not enough yeah yeah, yeah you don't want to only play one time in a day that's never a good thing <laughs> right you know hmm. okay so beth as a player yeah. as an yes. mvp player were there things that you were doing then that you look at as a coach now and you go Ugh. I can't believe it took me this long. I can't believe I, I only learned this as a coach. You know, my players have such an advantage. And if I had had that, I, I would have been better. Yes and no. Mm. The complexity of offensive systems and defensive systems has developed so much since I played, but it all seems like common sense. So I don't know why we didn't figure it out then. I, like, I remember we would try to run plays where we were, passing wide like a lot of what the um the wide pass and the option play like we would play around with that in practice but we never had the courage or maybe ball control to actually to run it in competition Mm -hmm. Uh, but i felt like when i was competing i got really lucky and was able to work with some incredible coaches and every single time i worked with a coach i felt like i learned something new that i would be able to incorporate into my own practices for the next couple of weeks and so I I think like that commitment to learning is consistent and has been consistent, but it's just, it, it makes me kind of crazy. Like when we played, we ran one of three defenses a hundred percent of the time. Like we didn't have any kind of variation. It was really tricky if we ran a back set, (laughs) Mm -hmm. you know? And so I think now (laughs) so so many systems have, you know, switched to mimic a little bit more of the indoor offense of the, zones one through five and the tempo with the 10, 20, 30, 40, 50. Like it is, 
I think for a long time as a player, I was so excited of how messy beach could be that I, I just, I loved that. Like I loved kind of seeing like, what can we get ourselves out of? Like how out of system can we be and still be successful? Because coming from an indoor background, you can't get out of system. Like if indoor, if your machine is not working, it's not successful. And so I think I may have been resistant for a while of really trying to be more methodical in the beach game, but that's what it's evolving to. And I think it's a really fun way of doing it as well. Um, but yeah, so I'm just, when I look back at my career, we truly like we ran ones and twos and the two was the current day four. And then. Oh, Sarah you never ran just a natural two. <laughs> No, no, never would know. <laughs> we ran one, I mean, yeah. yeah, we ran a one and a four, and then we had one play. Natural where two, we, unless you got a really short hitter that likes to bang. Yeah. That's the only time I'll do. When I know someone's too short or they can't jump high enough, but they want to, right. you know, and they want to bang, <laughs> I'm like, come on, you're going to tape it. I'm going to get a free ball. <laughs> A natural two is good for the ego players, I think. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, but yeah, we like we felt like we were really ahead of the curve because we had one defense that we intentionally doubled up. And we're like, oh, this is gonna and it is crazy how many times we would score when we would double up on our defense. And that at that time we never thought, hey, let's see how we can develop this in other ways. So like, oh, this is it. <laughs> got really fancy we have three defenses instead of um so i think i don't know i think that's something just looking back especially with how much time i committed to learning and trying to understand the game that it never occurred to me to kind of push some of those those walls or push some of those barriers were you getting coached at that time or was that just all self-discovery so I would generally save money and get a coach every couple days. of weeks. But I had I had the opportunity to work with Todd Maddox, and he coached at the Bishop School in San Diego. And he was he's he lives in South Mission where I lived, and he's like I'd be really interested in literally experimenting and seeing uh, you know what it's like to coach a beach team because I've only ever coached indoor. And so my partner at the time, her name is Susanna Manoli. She and I were like, oh, oh we'll I know be, Susanna. yeah, we'll be your team. We'd be happy to be your team. And so he was amazing. We would train. He was a teacher. So we would train from 545 in the morning until like 745. So he could go to, to school and we would just we'd practice things. And he'd be like, if something doesn't work, we'll throw it out and we'll change gears and do this. And so we got really lucky to get to work with him. And his approach to the entire game was don't let someone score on a bad shot. Like if someone can hit a ball straight down, we're going to give them that. And they're not, that's not a repeatable thing, but what's repeatable is bad shots. So we're going to come up with ways to stop that. And so we just all kind of learned together and grew from there. That's cool. Yeah, it was really, it was, a, it was those mornings, like when you can't feel your toes in the sand and the sun's coming up and and you feel like, okay, I'm already winning. Like I'm out here at, at sunrise and it's yeah. going to be a good day. <laughs> it's funny uh, coming out to California, like Hermosa, and you feel like a champ, you know? You're like, all right, I'm going out for a 7 a.m. practice. And like I'm before a ripped dude just on his 10th mile already going. And you're like, what? Like, <laughs> I thought I was the hard worker here. <laughs> <laughs> and there's the, and they're everywhere. Everybody's just everywhere. Like out getting fit yeah. and ripped and just doing it before work. Yeah, it's it's such I loved living in Southern California just for the like there's it's vibrant. Like there's always people out. Work was important, but I really felt like people would work from nine to five. Like at five oh five, the strand and the beaches are packed and people are outside enjoying the weather, enjoying the the sand and the sun. So I loved, and I, I fully, fully understand the, hey, I'm out here to get my work done. And there's 10 people that are working harder than me. And that's not what I came here to feel. <laughs> right. What do you miss the least about California? Oh, that is a great question. I don't actually, I don't think there was anything that I, I didn't love about being there. Like I can't say traffic because Atlanta traffic is equal Okay. So whatever is in California. So I feel like I just, that was like a horizontal move. 
I like, I definitely missed being far away from my family when I was on the West coast. Like that was okay. hard. So that would probably be, that would probably be the answer. But I just, I had such a wonderful chapter of my life, um, getting to live out there and, and explore the entire world of professional beach volleyball. It was so much fun. Yeah. Cool. I had a, I had somebody who grew up in the Southeast, moved out, made a bunch of money, like did, did really well. And then he just, he started saying like, it's too fleeting. He goes like every, every one of your group of friends, he's like in little rock, Arkansas, if somebody leaves your volleyball group, there's like this hole that can't be filled. That's true. You know? And, it, but he goes in California, somebody literally moves out of the state permanently and they're kind of just replaced by another yeah. guy and you, you kind of miss them, but then boom. So he, he just didn't feel like the, the bonding and the tightness of community um, was strong enough for him on the, on the beaches of Southern California, like the beach communities, just because yeah. there's so many tourists or like four or five year people yeah. coming in that it's so transient, I guess you can say. Yeah. I, but I, but that's also, I think why people move out there because like we all moved out there for selfish reasons to pursue something that was important to us. And b when you're in that mindset of, of doing something that's like, like chasing your dream, you're not there necessarily to make a bazillion connections. But I feel I've always felt like the vol the beach volleyball community is really tight knit. And, and I still have friends that I made in San Diego that I'm, I get to go back every summer. I'm so excited to go see them. But I, I can I can see that that it's maybe less um, substantial friendships or, or connections that you make. But I feel like you know a lot more people out there in the volleyball. Maybe that's what it is. In Little Rock, Arkansas, there's maybe only 10 people in the volleyball community. And in California, there's a thousand people. Right. Um, so you know yeah, a you lot can, more you can like You can avoid the people that you don't like. Right. <laughs> like, you know, in certain towns, like this, especially the town that I, that I grew up in the summers, like the guy that you didn't like, he's going to be in your friend group for the next 20 yeah. years so like just yep. get used to them and deal with it and there's something good about that there's something wholesome about you know not just parting or being able to avoid yeah. that or that person you have to work with it work with the tension you have to grow up around that i think that's important yeah okay well i'm gonna i'm gonna wrap you up with a with a few kind of rapid fire questions so i want you to okay. i've never done this before but i want you to, to see if we can can do it okay so always think of the fastest easiest or most common or the number of, of times that you utilize this okay? okay fastest way to fix someone's passing don't try to fix it give them a new way to do it <laughs> so vague okay <laughs> fastest way to fix somebody's setting okay wait the fastest way to fix someone's passing is have them hold their platform until the setter touches the ball so i'm looking for more like cues specifically something that you can use and specifically something that you i got can, you i got you know you. like yep. a Techniques. blanket thing where if you could give the most effective yeah okay. fix for looking at a thousand people blind and it would fix the most people's issues you know okay <laughs> okay so i'm ready to go now I'll go back to question one all right passing fix form early hold late form early hold late it's it's always interesting to me, the form early thing, because there are so many high level players and coaches that, that have said, you know, I grew up in the keep your hands apart until the last second, don't form like in the middle and, and then twist outside. And then, you know, even Dustin Watton, who's got some great online programs, national team libero. He said that yeah. the best advice that he got was from John Sparrow, who was saying, put your hands together as late as possible. Mm -hmm. And for me personally, when I make the fix of getting my hands together, literally before serve contact, I have my best steadiest passing days. And so I give that advice to my players. Like I would rather, if we're talking about like firearms, right? Would you wait until this object is three <laughs> feet from your face before pulling your thing out of your holster and shooting it? Or would you yeah. set up your firearm and wait for a thing to be shot and then get it as early as you can? Yeah, no, that makes sense. I think also just for the beach, because you want the ball to slow down, mm. the more still your platform is, the more you can absorb. If you're making your platform at the last second, you 
the most elite athletes are, it's a, that's a different discussion. But if I'm looking at a thousand people and I'm telling them to form late, most of them are going to swing their arms into the ball. Okay. Cool. All right. Uh, setting. To help someone improve their setting. Mm -hmm. Platform or hand setting. Which one? Let's go hands. Hands high early. It's high early. Okay. Like up above your head or like positioned by face or above forehead. How to... Pouring a two liter of Coca-Cola on your forehead. Nice. Okay. Attacking. Hard step close. Like aggressive pop pop. Okay. And then the last one I'll go is a uh, floor defense. So ground defense. Ground defense? Yeah. So not like block blockers. Just oh, blockers. okay. And how to make someone better at that? Yep. Blanket statement. Know what your priorities are. Could you elaborate on that? Yes. So in every defense, you have a primary responsibility and a secondary responsibility. And you want to make sure you're taking those two. If you're trying to take all of the possibilities, you are not going to make any plays. And so I think it's really important to know what you must take, like what is going to piss off your partner if you don't dig that ball, and then what you should get, and then know what you're leaving. I love that. I love that so much. You see so many, I would say young and fiery players, but you see the same 40, 50, and 60-year-old players who they get so pissed every time they lose a point yeah. and then you see an avp player who claps once after a clean kill and resets it and they kind of you know wave a hand at their partner and they're okay with it knowing yeah. that the other team is supposed to score the majority of the time yeah <laughs> absolutely and you're just cataloging so they got that clean kill they know they got the clean kill they know you know they got the kill what are they going to do next mm-hmm Yep. You didn't lose a point. You gained information Absolutely. and a statistic. So well said. So well said. Thank you. Thank you. I've been on air for a while now. <laughs> <laughs> cool. So but is there any other uh, advice or, you know, if, if you had a, a billboard for volleyball players, coaches, or club directors oh, that yeah. you would just put up for the entire world to see? Is, is there anything that you would share for any coach, director, or player out there? If I had billboard, it would say lift each other up. And I think that this community does an incredible job of sharing knowledge and sharing information for the greater good. Now, obviously, we all have our little secrets and magic tricks that we don't necessarily want to put out there for everyone to know. But I think the more that we're willing to share, and this was something from my experience playing and now my experience coaching, there'd be so many times that we would be competing or training and I would play with people that were way better than me and they'd stop and they'd be like, hey, you're moving too early when you're running this defense. And then someone would be like, well, why would you tell her that? Don't you want to win? And the person would be like, no, I want to get better. I'm not necessarily here to win in training. I want to get better in training so I can win in games. And so I think when we take the time to lift each other up and help everybody be better, we all improve, whether it's as people or as athletes or as coaches. That's really cool. And I, I've been in that situation. It's, you know, sometimes I'll, I'll use it as smack, smack talk with, with friends, yeah. you know, yeah. I'll use it as smack talk. I like before the hit okay, too early, you yeah. know? Um, but then other times I'll let them know because if I'm playing a worse skill team, I need them to upgrade. So it's not necessarily me being nice. I won't, I won't lie. Like I need them to upgrade their defense quickly. If I'm going to train yeah. against them so that I get challenged appropriately. Yeah. You know? Absolutely. But, uh, I'm not, I'm not going to go ahead and tell Nick and John, like and, yeah, you were too early again. I saw you leaning. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They may not, they may not need those pointers, but I, I think it's a, uh, I think it's really helpful when we share information and that's something like in our practices at georgia state that we encourage people to speak through the net to help each other we definitely have games where you have to heckle and talk smack so that you get used to it in um, real competition as well but i think also that might be the difference in the men's game and the women's game kind of how you said women one of the turn offs was to be mean to somebody on the other side of the net right mm -hmm. whereas men talking smack to somebody on the other side of the net is a fun way to fire each other up but i think that we can still share information in those mediums. Do you think I just made a big post about this, about like 
uh, smack talk and getting chippy with other teams. And I love it. I think it's yeah. fun. I think fans enjoy seeing it. Um, and then there is that school, a whole section of people that say there's no place for it, that it should be your skill, your sport. In my mind, when I really think about it, like, should, should you be jerks to each other? No, you should challenge each other. And I think that that's appropriate. That's also what I grew up with was a, mm-hmm. just a ton of, of sarcasm and constant challenge. Yeah. But like the people who I challenged the most, I actually loved the most in my life. Right. You know, so that was the norm for me. But whether or not you think it belongs, in my mind, you have to be prepared for it, for the sport and the world. Because if you can't, if, if words break your bones, you know, (laughs) then sticks and stones are for sure going to break them. Yeah, absolutely. I think people love seeing personality, you know, and I think it's fun when you're watching and teams get a little smack talky, but then a couple plays later, they might high five or help each other up under the net. You know, I think getting to see the person and not just the player is really, I think that's super attractive to fans. And sometimes that is maybe not someone's best side, or sometimes it's their, you know, cocky side, or sometimes maybe it's the humble side. But I think getting to see who the person is as a player is really fun. But absolutely, you know, if you know you're going to play against a team that's going to talk a lot, it's really important to practice that. And I think across the board for colleges, we all do. You know when you're going to play a really loud team. Mm. And we'll set up games where where one of the roles is heckling. And you have to hug it out afterwards or (laughs) high five it out or whatever your choice of washing it out is. But Could get ugly, yeah. (laughs) That's one of the roles is you have to sit on the sideline and you either – scream like crazy for your team or you tell the other team how terrible their decision making might be Mm -hmm. because if the first time you're exposed to anything is in competition it's way too hard to figure out how to handle it at that point yeah and i think people do need some situation where safely they can learn a lesson that they have to tell somebody else when to shut up like when enough is enough that to me is something valuable for life You have to be able to, at some point, stand up for yourself. You have to be able to, at some point, hear negative stuff about yourself and keep Mm -hmm. moving forward. Mm -hmm. And then it's up to you, like how you want to react to it, whether you want to ignore it or put a stop to it. Yeah, both of them are tactics, but that's a it's a whole world within itself. Or I think sometimes the best way to defuse hecklers is to laugh at it because. There are some amazing hecklers yeah, great. and it's, it's so much fun to watch. And, you know, sometimes you'll see the players engage with it a little bit and kind of play with people heckling on the side. And, and I think that's, I don't know, that's fun to watch as long as the, the athlete can manage that without getting derailed from the game plan. Mm-hmm. Yeah. There's a, there's a line of, of hecklers. It's like, if you choose to heckle, you're choosing to be a stand up comedian, you know, right. essentially, right. you know, and you're there are stand up comedians spotlight. that get booed off the stage, yep. you know, like there are terrible comedians out there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so I do really appreciate the good hecklers and the bad ones. It's just like, oh, man, you're really yeah. more embarrassing yourself. You know? Right. Right. I just, I feel bad for you at this moment. <laughs> <laughs> And that's a great thing to turn around and say to them. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, um, no, I think I think it's fun. And I think some of the most well known players that were not playing at the very top of the AVP are well known because of their personalities. And yeah. I think that's one of the one of again, another unique thing about our sport being as small as it as it is and as accessible as it is. I think getting to to connect with someone's personality as a fan or a friend or family member is a really neat thing to do. Do you think, uh, I've debated this back and forth, do you think that the person who exists on the court is indicative of who they are off the court in a regular situation, or can they exist completely separate? You know, can you be an absolute jerk on the court and you would never react like that in a real life situation or, you know, with family or, you know, boyfriends, girlfriends, friends, et cetera? Wow. I, yes, I think that you will see, it's very rare, but I think there are some people that can absolutely have an on stage or an on court persona that only exists in that space. I don't, yeah, I don't think it's common. I think if you're a jerk, 
you're a jerk and you'll be a jerk with your friends and families and you'll be a jerk on the court. But I definitely like, I can think of one person that I got to play against that I knew really well off the court and she would behave on the court. And I was like, I don't even think I know you. And she would never show a glimpse of that under pressure or under stress or intention outside of playing. Mm. Yeah. I always think of actors, you know, like I, I, I do think sometimes of sport as, as acting, there are yeah. some people who, and Janelle, my wife's a, a, a stunt woman. So she like gets to interact yeah. with a lot of actors and actresses. And she's like, they are the exact same person that they are on camera. Like they don't change wow. <laughs> at all. Okay. And then some of them they're like, it's crazy how different they are from their characters or how different, like John Malkovich, who always plays some kind of psycho. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, he's like, she's like, he was the sweetest old man. And he like <laughs> asked me how my day was going. Like he stopped me and yeah. he said, Hey, how are you? These snacks are great. Aren't they? You know? <laughs> oh my goodness. That's amazing. Yeah. No, I think, I think it is. I think that's such a great comparison, Mark. Like there certainly, it is a stage and it is a performance for a lot of people. And they can have very private lives off the court that have nothing to do with how bold or big they may be um, in competition. Yeah. I'd love cool. to see it, the John Malkovich of beach volleyball. <laughs> who, do, who do you think is the farthest person, guy or girl, professional player right now, from who you would assume or know mm -hmm. they are off court? Like, where do you see the biggest oh, I don't separation? know a ton of professional players right now. I think I probably have to start there. Okay. But like the person that resonate, like the person that I immediately think of from when I played is Dana Camacho. Like <laughs> he was this character. How does he get into every volleyball conversation 20 years later? <laughs> yeah, because of his, because of the personality. But yeah. then like off the court, he like loved organizing and like it was just a comp I remember listening to him talk about organizing a closet once and I was I was baffled cleanest individual I have ever lived with I lived with him oh for a well, there you go there you go ate like a bird he would have literally a quarter of a grilled cheese sandwich like yeah. for his lunch I was like what the hell uh <laughs> like that's exactly what we're talking about though right like yeah. he's very different from one to the other I think women that I played with Alicia Polzin, like she was a huge personality. She's a huge personality in general, mm. but on the court, she was very aggressive. She would, she would laugh some, but in person, like she's wildly creative. She sews clothes and just has like this whole other side of her that is much more nurturing and calm than the person she was on the court. Yeah. She punted a lot of volleyballs. That was fun. <laughs> <laughs> Do you let your players punt? No. no. We've had one person punted. When, there's not a lot of punting in the college game. Right, and I think but like at practice, practice, do you it. let them? We would have to practice. Like okay. you would have to be a respectable punter <laughs> if you were going to actually get to punt a ball. Um, <laughs> I mean, that might actually be a like, fun fall thing to do. Practice if you punt it, it better hit the ceiling. <laughs> yeah. 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 It's got to go over the fence. <laughs> right. That's, Yeah. <laughs> I think that's a good rule. If you're going to, yeah. if you're going to punt, you know, there was one it's guy uh, in Jersey for years. He would always punt a ball. He would, he had like anger, but he was just a great guy. You would see him winding up for a punt. And yeah. the key is that if you were able to block his punt, everybody on your court had to buy you a beer. <laughs> so people would like see him like start getting fired up and you'd like really pay attention during the tournament. Like, which angle is it coming from? Yeah. I'm going to dive. <laughs> Great role. Yeah. Punting. I, you know, I haven't seen a good punt in a while in beach volleyball, but I think college is a lot more reserved than the, the pro space. I probably need to get back out to the beaches in Southern California for some punting action. Yeah. I like a good punt every now and then yeah. it happens less frequently, but yeah. Yeah. Still enjoy it. Cool. Hey Beth, um, this is a great talk. So easy. Yeah. Easy Thank you so much. It's been fun getting to uh learn learn from you and answer some questions. Uh and I really enjoyed it. Yeah, easy conversation. Yeah. It was easy. The internet um, didn't always work with us, but the conversation was flowing. Hey, you know, we we saw, we overcame. Yep. <laughs> Absolutely. Very good. 
Uh, is there anything else, uh, any projects or any websites or anything that you're doing or something that, that anybody should just like be paying attention to that you're involved with that you want to share um, while, while we're still here? Nothing that I think I'm able to endorse. <laughs> okay. Um, but cool. thank you for asking that question. I really appreciate that. Yeah, of course. Um, and uh, you guys can always go ahead and follow her. Her links are below. Uh, you can check out Georgia State University Beach Volleyball, of course, the American, uh, the AVCA, American Volleyball Coaches Association. And you can check out her as she leads the future of the sport as well as the current. You know, you're one of the most powerful personalities uh, in, in our sport right now. And it, it hides. Uh, but uh, thank you so much for for your service and the direction that you've given the sport. Uh, thank you. And I again, I'm just super grateful uh, to be in the sport. I think, again, going back to a story about my dad, when I decided to move to San Diego to play beach volleyball, he's like, this is the worst financial decision of your life. And at the time, I told him it wasn't a financial decision. It was a life decision. I had no idea that college coaching for beach volleyball was ever going to be a thing and it's just crazy how life works out when you trust your inner voice and you follow it i like that that's yeah. your billboard right there that's my billboard <laughs> hear your uh, inner voice do as it says yeah coach beth thank you so much mark it's been great getting to chat with you thank you same here appreciate Have a time. wonderful evening all right we'll do you too and we'll thank talk you. soon bye-bye